That's weird. Why would it be doing this? You're just seeing a black screen, right? This is a new a new feature that they just released. Now we can see aha. Uh -huh. Okay. Mystery. It's a mystery. Okay. Um, any questions before we start? Um, so the main uh, topic for today is going to be the harmonic oscillator, but before I do that, I just want to make a few comments, uh, leftover comments for, uh, for the, um, representations. Um, there was one, uh, thing that we, that we didn't get to, um, So um, let me just, um, so it's really, a, the topic is called Klepsch-Gordon uh, decomposition. Okay, so the idea of this is that, uh, let's suppose that we have two representations of SU2. Irreducible representations. What are these, by the way? Um, what, one easy way to... So there's several ways that you could label them. You could either label them by their dimension, because we saw that they, there's one for every dimension uh, starting with dimension one, one, two, three, et cetera. For each number like that, there's, a, there's, a, there's an irreducible representation of SU2. Uh, an, an easy way to label them would be to do it like this, that you, um, you uh, so list of irreps So there's the standard representation, um, I'll just call it V, I guess. Just C2, the standard representation. And then um, the point is that uh, in order to build the three-dimensional representation, you could take S2V, or I think I called it before SIM2V. So these are symmetric tensors, two tensors in V. Or you could think of it as polynomials of degree two in two generators. And we know that there's like x squared, xy, and y squared. So there's three of them. So this is a three-dimensional space. This is the vector representation. And physicists would call this, um, I guess they would, uh, they might even just use the, um, the dimension. They, would, they might call this like a bold two, and this would be a bold three. Um, and then there's also sim zero, 
which by definition is just a C, the trivial representation. And then you could get all the others by just taking uh, sim k v, which is c to the k plus one, and this would have a, this would be like k plus one. So that's those are all of them. So so two irreducible representations. Let's say um, uh, let's say s k uh, v and s l uh, v. Okay, so the whole point about the Klebsch Gordon uh, Gordon decomposition is what happens when you take the tensor product of two representations, two irreducible representations. So if we take SKV tensored with SLV, okay, then this is a, another representation, right? Because if I have an element U inside SU2, then it will act on a tensor product, let's say um, A tensor B, by just acting simultaneously on both. And this is obviously a representation. Oops, sorry, I'm just writing it to be B. So we have another representation, but there's no reason to think that it's irreducible. It, it could be that uh, now that we've created a new representation, maybe it's not irreducible. Maybe there are subspaces, which uh, which you can express the the whole representation as a sum of subspaces, where the subspaces are invariant under the action of the SU two. So the question is, uh, how, you know, what do you get? What irreps? Um, uh, are contained in this tensor product. Okay, and the uh, the answer is 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 given by this theorem of Klebsch Gordon. Okay, so let me just give an example to uh, to illustrate what I'm talking about. So. When we take, um, let's say we take S2V tensored with S3V. Okay, so let's just draw a picture. Uh, when we draw these pictures, what we're thinking of is remember that little U1 inside, inside SU2, the U1, which is generated by the matrix one minus one, right? That's going to have, um, that's going to have three weights, uh, weight zero and two and minus two for the three-dimensional representation. And for the four-dimensional representation, we're going to have minus one, plus one, plus three, and minus three. So these are the picture, th this is the picture that you should have in your head for these two representations. And we're tr trying to take their tensor product. Okay. So how uh thomas that's a great shot amazing shot it looks fantastic uh there's a very famous filmmaker that makes shots like that uh nathaniel dorsky you've, you've mastered it <laughs> cheers uh uh so the way that we identify representations remember is by figuring out their highest weight right so so what is the highest weight? So remember that that uh, that highest weight, or um, so. So the question is, well, okay. So what we want to do is we want to draw the diagram of this of this tensor product, right? We want to know what the weights are, what the highest weights are, and so on. So um, how do we figure that out? So what are the weights? of this product, of this tensor product. Okay, so, well, I mean, what does that mean? What, what does it mean when we ask for weights? Weights, these are the eigenvalues of the H acting. This is the H uh, uh, operator, which is acting 
on um, on V, or on let me call this W, it's acting on W via the Lie algebra representation. Okay, so remember that we we have we have the group acting, but it's Lie algebra is also acting. And uh, remember that the Lie algebra had three generators, H, E, and F. And then it's the action of H, which tells us the weights, because that's that action of H, that's the charge operator for the U1, for the U1 that's sitting inside U, SU2. So if I know how H acts on this thing, then I'll be able to look at the eigenspaces and I'll be able to tell kind of what the weights are for this representation. And I'll try to figure out the representation from that. So how, let's implement this strategy. How does H act on a tensor product, uh, A tensor B? The answer is it through the Lie algebra action. And remember that, uh, that the Lie algebra action is the derivative of the action. So, so in other words, if if you um, you know if if uh, if a unitary you know if an element of SU two acts on A tensor B by just simultaneously acting, right? Then an element in the Lie algebra of SU two this acts on A tensor B by basically differentiating this with respect to t. Imagine that you exponentiated x to get u, and you this imagine this was an exponential of x, e to the tx, e to the tx. If we differentiated this with respect to t, we would get an x of acting here, and then a, neck, then a sum by the Leibniz rule with a, an x acting there. So the way that x acts is by xa tensor b plus a tensor xb. Okay, so you see that um, that if so, if A has weight, uh, <clears throat> let's say, uh, let me call it, uh, if it has weight uh, K1 and B has weight K2, okay, then H A tensor B is going to be H A tensor B plus A tensor HB. And this is going to be K1 plus K2 multiplied by A tensor B. So that you get a sum of the weights. Okay, is that, is that clear? This is the key point that when you have, when you, when you try to figure out the weight of a tensor product, it will be the sum of the weights of the, of the, of the multiplicands or of the, of the, of the factors. Okay, so this means that if um, if you have a basis, let's say, what did we have? We had S two v and we had S three v, right? And this had weights minus three, minus one, one, and three, and this had weights minus two, zero, and two. And if we uh, take the tensor product, the tensor product will have a basis exactly like this. There's going to be a basis element for each of the dots, right? So, um, so each blue dot represents a uh, basis element for S2V tensor S3V. Okay, and we can see what the what the weights are. So the weights will be the sum of the uh, of the two weights. So, for example, this element here, okay, because it is the tensor product of an element of weight minus two and an element of weight minus three, it will have weight minus five. Okay, so really, you should think and look at this. This one here has weight. 0 plus minus 3, so it's minus 3. And this one also has weight minus 3 because it's minus 1 plus minus 2. So that means that both of these have weight minus 3. And these have weight 
uh, uh, minus one. No, um, I'm sorry, what did I do? This one has weight minus three. This has weight minus three. This one has weight one minus two. So that's weight minus one. And so do these two. So basically along the diagonals, you have things of constant weight, okay? So what you need to do is to project, you know, this way. Okay, and what you're gonna get is six positions, six different possible weights. What are, what's the top weight? The top weight is the sum of three plus two, so it's five, and the bottom weight is minus five, okay? But, uh, be, you know, be, after five, it's gonna be three plus zero. So this will be three, uh, this will be one, this will be minus one, this will be uh, minus three, okay? So this is what the diagram looks like. Now, do not be fooled into thinking that we get here that this is equal to S, 5v. This is not possible because this thing has dimension 6, this has dimension 3, this has dimension 4. And th this thing has dimension 3 times 4, which is 12. This thing only has dimension 6, this has dimension 12. So there's no way that they're going to be equal. And the reason is obvious. The reason is that there's only one dimensional space getting sent to this dot, but there are two one-dimensional spaces that are getting sent here. So the correct diagram would be really that you should circle this one a second time. This one has three, so I should circle two times. So that's like three, multiplicity three. Uh, sorry, multiplicity two, which is the dimension of the weight three subspace. Okay. And that one is three, this one is three, this one is two, and uh, that, that is the correct thing. So I have, I have one, two, three, four, five, six, but then I also have seven, eight, nine, ten, and I have 11 and 12. So in total, I have a 12 dimensional space and you can kind of see what's happening that the way that you would analyze this representation is you would start with the highest weight, five, and then you would notice that it generates a one, two, three, four, five more. So it generates a six dimensional representation by applying E and F. So this diagram now can be expressed as a super, as a superimposition of, so it has from minus five, minus three, minus one, one, three, and five. So there's this. But then on top of this, we also have um, a minus three to three. And on top of this, we have uh, minus one and one. And so it is the sum of these three representations. This one is V. This one is S uh, <clears throat> three V. And this one is S uh, <clears throat> 5v. And so the true answer is S5v direct sum S3v direct sum S1v or just v. Okay. So this is the this is the the Klebsch-Gordon decomposition. You just uh, you just take the product and you sum along the diagonals and then you just separate it out. Uh, you know just divide it out into these strings. Each string is an irreducible, and it, you could have several strings, one on top of the other. So that's how it works. And so the Klebsch-Gordon theorem uh, is basically just, I mean, th this explains how to prove it. I mean, you can basically guess what the theorem will say now. If you have um, uh, two uh, representations, um, let's say Vn is the irrep of SU2, of dimension n, if you take the tensor product of two of them, you're just going to get <clears throat> you're going to get uh, the highest weight is going to be the one which has the sum n1 plus n2, 
And then um, you're going to get something which is n1 plus n2 minus 2, so 2, le two less, all the way down to uh, v uh, n1 minus n2, whichever one is, whichever, uh, if n1 is bigger than n2, then uh, I, I don't need this absolute value. But basically, you just get a sum of irreducible representations. Okay, and I just I just gave a diagrammatic proof of this for the case S two V uh, tensor S three V. Okay, so um, uh, right. So this is. Um, This is important because um, remember that the way that we combine quantum systems is by tensor product. So if you have one particle, a spin one half particle, which has two st internal states of spin, okay, th that means that the state space for that one particle is, a, is V. And if we then throw more and more of these particles, um, then, um, or, or, or even if you just have them lined up on a, on a circuit or something, then um, the total system will be the tensor product of those. Okay, and it might be that the, that when you, you know, when you rotate the lab, right, you are acting on all of these particles together. So you are, you are doing a representation of SU2, which is acting equally on all of them. And that's exactly what you're doing. And so the question is, you know, when you act by these rotations in the lab, um, you can um, you can imagine that the way that th the way that this affects the state of the tensor product is uh, is um, it kind of decomposes into these larger representations. So the funny thing is that you know even though the individual particles are spin one half particles that behave individually in V, it could very well be that, um, that when, you, uh, when you act on you know, an ensemble of particles, that there will be a subspace of states which, um, which behaves like this. It behaves as if there were a particle of higher spin uh, hidden inside the system. So um, yeah, so... Um, Yeah, that's all I wanted to say. So there is this uh, interesting uh, topic. Um, and I guess uh, when we do the hydrogen atom, this will show up, this decomposition will show up. Um, okay, so I have, uh, I have half an hour before the, the, uh, the quiz. So there's gonna be a 15 minute quiz at, from three o'clock to 3.15 on Quarkus. Uh, uh, just, um, Maybe you should just open it up and uh, check that you have access to the quiz. Okay. Okay. So for the rest of today, I'm going to talk about the harmonic oscillator, which is the, uh, you know, I'm told that it's a, the, the most important quantum system. Okay, so um, someone says, I would have gotten this question right on the homework if you had this lecture any earlier. Yeah, I know. I mean, I, uh, that's, you say that as if, uh, as if I failed in my strategy. It's, I didn't, I succeeded. It was, it was by design. <laughs> so, uh, okay, so what's the harmonic oscillator? So remember that, um, that uh, the configuration space is just the real line with a coordinate x. And then the phase space is R2 
um, with x and momentum p. And the uh, and um, this phase space uh, has a Hamiltonian, a Hamiltonian function, uh, which is uh, p squared over 2m. That's the kinetic energy term plus one half uh, k x squared. Okay, so this is the um, the potential v of x okay which is a confining potential in the sense that the force minus the derivative of v is the force and it's the force is pushing in because it's a spring Where, uh, where K, so K, we, we, when we studied this before, we gave K this, um, this expression because omega was the frequency of oscillation. And in the phase space, remember that we had this picture X and P where the trajectories were given by uh, circles. And so that means that the, the position is basically undergoing sinusoidal motion. And that's why it's called an oscillator. And uh, um, right, and so um, a uh, the way that we solve the way that we can solve this uh, is that we're going to use a little trick to solve this. So what I'll do is I'll I'll think of the face. So this is just a, a trick for uh, simplifying the solution, we're gonna think of uh, the phase space R2 as C. We're gonna write uh, a complex number, which is um, the position in the real part and the momentum in the imaginary part. Okay, and if we write the equation of motion uh, which is just F equals MA, right? Uh, what we're going to get is Z dot is equal to minus I omega Z. I'm writing it now as a time derivative of a complex number. Okay, this just makes it super obvious how to solve the system. We just get that Z of T is whatever it is at time zero times e to the minus i omega t. And we get a frequency omega oscillation. Okay, so this is the classical system. So that, That's the classical system. Okay, so now we want to define the quantum system. We want to define a version of this, uh, which is for quantum mechanics. So um, we're going to use uh, for the quantum system. The typical thing to do, uh, one of the typical things that you might do, is to take functions on the configuration space. So these functions, we could take, um, for our purposes, yeah, we're, we could just take L2 functions on the real line with complex values. The, this is the, the space of the Hilbert space of wave functions the Hilbert space of wave functions on the configuration space. Complex valued functions. Where the inner product of F and G, just like we did on the circle, is going to be the integral of F bar G. OK. 
Okay. Um, okay. And and now, uh, so now we're going to need to do something that we didn't do for the circle. Um, remember that the circle, uh, when it was moving on the circle, we had uh, the Hamiltonian was just the kinetic energy because it was a free particle on the circle. But now it's not free. Now there's a force acting on it. And in order to write that force, I needed to use this function, x. I used this function. Let me just highlight uh, the functions that I used on the phase space. The phase space had certain real valued functions, p and x. And I used those functions. I, I used uh, algebra to combine those functions together with these cons excuse me, with these constants. And what I got was the Hamiltonian function uh, h. Okay. So if I want to get a Hamiltonian operator on this space, I'm going to, uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to uh, ask for the, um, the corresponding operators for p and for x. Okay. So, um, Okay, and, and this, so the idea is, so we want to quantize X and P, i.e. we want to promote them from functions on phase space to um, operators on V, okay? And uh, there, is no, um, there is no constructive way in general to do this. There is something called geometric quantization, which gives a procedure which uh, would work in this case. But um, uh, the question is really to figure out a way to make this work and then to try to compare the quantum system with the classical system. So it's, it's really, um, it's not a derivation in other words, but let me just say what the operators are. So, so the operator P is going to be as before, as it was on the circle. Remember what happened to P. P was the, uh, P was the, um, the function on phase space that generates translation in X. And the operator which generates translation is the uh, differentiation in X. And so that's what's going to happen with this P. So P is minus I H bar D by DX. This is the, the, um, uh, the operator which generates via flows translation uh, in the x direction. Yeah. And uh, the um, so what is the x, uh, the x operator? So the x operator is a little bit tricky. Uh, it turns out to be very simple. It's, I'll, I'll just give it a name. It's m sub x. This means that it's the operator from L2 functions on R to L2 functions on R, which is just taking a function and multiplying it by the coordinate function x. So it uses the, uh, this single function x uh, as an operator by multiplying everything by it, okay? And so it's, very, it's a little bit difficult to justify why this is the correct thing to do, why this is the correct operator that replaces x. Uh, let me explain why. So, um, uh, so you know, the way that you're supposed to uh, intuitively discover which operators are your, are your quantized observables is by thinking about their eigenvalues. So when we're looking for an X hat, what we're looking for is an operator that has all the possible X values as its, eigenval as its eigenvalues, right? Because remember that when we were, when we were dealing with uh, the switch, we only had two positions of the switch. Okay, and so we wanted an operator that had those two eigenvalues, the eigenvalue plus one and the eigenvalue minus one for the two positions of the switch. But this thing is not a switch, it's a particle which is along, it could be at any point in the real line. And we want an operator that has zero as an eigenvalue, 0 0.3, 0 0.7, 3.8. Every possible value here should be an eigenvalue for the operator. 
Okay, that's what would give us the feeling that we have the right kind of operator because it, it, it is demonstrating all possible classical values as its eigenvalues. That would be the analog of the switch going, okay? So, so the question is, you know, why, why, should we, why should we believe the claim that mx, that this x hat has any, any real number as an eigenvalue? Um, well, the, the reason is because if you, if you have, uh, let, let's say that you wanted to find a wave function with eigenvalue, you know, 3.72, okay? So ca can we find a wave function with, um, with uh, eigenvalue uh, 3.72 for x? In other words, I need to find a function psi of x in L2 such that when I multiply it by x, the function x, I'm going to get another function. And this function is just 3.72 times the original function. Yeah, I mean, good luck with this. So, you know, you're going to take, you're supposed to have some function, you multiply it by x, which is a function, oh, sorry, where's zero? Zero is here. Okay, so we have the function x, which just looks like this. And then I multiply it by my, my function that I'm looking for. And I'm just going to get a scale multiple of that function. Okay, so, um, so that, that, doesn't, um, that doesn't really make sense because um, you know, the, the value of x is only, the only time that the value of this function is 3.72 is exactly at this point where it has this value, which is 3.72. So the only function that X multiplies against to give 3.72 times that function is exactly the function which is zero everywhere and which has a delta function you know, value at 3.72, okay? which, which of course is not a function, but it's a, it's a distribution or some something in the, in the completion of the space of smooth functions. Okay, so in, in this sense, um, this is the sense in which this thing intuitively is the correct quantum operator. Okay, but, but really uh, this type of argument is not needed. So we don't, we don't need to go into these details at all because we, what, what's, what's more important is that we need to have a definition of the quantum system. And uh, this is the operator that we're going to use. Okay, now there's a problem. Um, there's a problem with this operator. Can someone tell me what the problem with this operator is? Is it unbounded? Uh, well, yeah. Can you? Uh, 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 well, so what do you mean? So. I wrote that this is an operator from this to this. And so I'm claiming that there's a problem with this statement. So what's the problem? It should be, I guess, only defined on a dense subset of L2. Dense. And what would that dense subset be? Uh, or let's say, what, what does it contain? What, give me an example of, of a subset where it is defined. Oh, like so, so compactly supported functions? Yes. If you have a compactly supported function, okay, <clears throat> then multiply it by x. Okay, then you know the problem with multiplication by x is that it's getting very, very large. When when uh, x is very large, the value of the function is very large, and so you might, you know, if I take uh, if I take a function in L two and multiply it by x, maybe it's not in L two anymore. Maybe the function is too big. Okay, so this is an example of an unbounded uh, operator, uh, and it's actually not even defined on L two. It's only defined on a subspace of L two. But these types of operators happen so frequently. Um, and by the way, this, this operator has the same problem. Uh, there's no reason for an L2 function to be differentiable or to have, different, or to have derivative in L2, okay? So, so why, we have no right to call these operators on L2 because they don't map from L, L2 is not their domain, okay? So the result is the, you know, the, the 
what do, what do mathematicians do when they're presented with something like this? Well, they change the definition. They change the rules of the game. So the, the, the rule of the game is that you still call it an operator. And you say that an operator on a Hilbert space, okay, is two things. It's, an, it's a domain first, which is a dense or some subset of the Hilbert space together with a map from that subset to the Hilbert space. So you just redefine what you mean by an operator uh, and you need to do this uh, when studying these infinite dimensional spaces, just because there's a lot of these operators. There's a lot of operators which are of great importance, um, which are not defined on the whole space. And that's a new thing. Uh, it should be the third class after 240, 247, there should be a Hilbert space class. Um, and uh, in that Hilbert space class, you would learn you know, how to do everything in the first two classes, but in infinite dimensions. I don't know why it's not organized this way, but that's, that's the way it is. Okay, so, um, so this, is, this is our system. And, um, and uh, okay, well, whenever you have uh, two operators, you should always check what, how they, what their commutation relation is. Because these operators, they are, um, um, we're gonna see what this means later, but they're, they're for, you know, they, they, they're symmetric operators. They behave like self-adjoint operators. In other words, if I multiply uh, G by X and then integrate, that's the same thing as multiplying F by X and integrating. So the multiplication by X is a self-adjoint operator. The only problem is that we need to know what does it really mean to be self-adjoint when you're not really an operator, okay? When you're an operator in this generalized sense. So that's coming up uh, soon. Um, so these are generalizations of self-adjoint operators. Chris, uh, you have your hand up, but I know you don't have your hand up. Oh, well, so I do actually have my hand oh, up. Oh, you do have your hand up. Yeah. Okay, what's your question? Uh, I was just wondering like, when you're talking about identifying like our classical observables with, I guess, like quantum observables, do, does like um, theorems like like the Gelfand Nymark theorem for C star algebras come into play as far as identifying like observables of classical systems? So like I guess complex value functions, or real value functions with some operators in an operator algebra on a Hilbert space. Like I, I know these are unbounded operators like we just talked about, but. Like if you had, I don't know. The Alfan Nymark theorem is about is about the C star algebra of continuous functions on a compact manifold. So there, this unbounded stuff doesn't occur in that case yeah. uh, in the same way. Um, not not for multiplication by the function, um, and uh, and you get a commutative C star algebra in that case. It's it's a the, the Gelfand Nymark theorem is a is a is a simple classical theorem about commutative C star algebras, and it has no bearing on on uh, the relationship between classical and quantum. It's really just okay. about classical. Okay, okay. Yeah. That makes sense. And, and you should not think that there is, there is a definitive procedure for producing the quantum system of a classical system. There just is not. It's the other way around. If you have a, class, if you have a quantum system, there is a way of taking a limit. You have to be very careful how to do this. I, I, I would love to to cover this in the class, but I don't think that there's enough time. Um, that you, you should, you, there, there's a way of, of taking a limit which recovers the classical system in the limit. So you should really think that the, well, anyway, yeah. You should really think that the, that the classical system is some kind of um, idealization at the boundary of the space of quantum systems. Okay, uh, it's, right. it's really something um, it's something that's at infinity in a way in the quantum world. Yeah, okay. I remember we spoke about that actually a little bit. Oh yeah, okay. So, uh, okay, so that means that we need, we would like to know, um, for example, what, uh, what happens when we take the commutator between these operators. Okay, and um, I have to put this annoying one over I in front the H bar is not important. We could just set H bar to one, but the one over I, the reason this is showing up is because remember, it's not the self-adjoint operators that are a Lie algebra. It's the skew adjoint operators. So this is the, um, you know, what you should really do is, is take, you know, 
minus i, you should re really take like i x hat. This one is skew adjoint. This one is skew adjoint. The, the commutator, that's the Lie algebra of skew adjoint. So this thing would be skew adjoint. And then you should multiply by one over i. And then this would be the Lie algebra uh, structure on self adjoint. Because this would be skew adjoint. Right. So if you if you do this, then you just cancel out the i, and you get basically this this expression. That's the reason why the i is there, because I want to make sure that this thing is uh, um, self-adjoint. This will be self-adjoint. Um, let me just grab this and make it. Sorry. Um, so th this this is going to be uh, if I if I apply it to a wave function, let's say, then I'll get you know multiplication by x um, times d by dx psi minus d by d some constants times um, uh, d by dx x psi. I'm just I'm just leaving out the constants. You can work out the constants yourself. The important thing is that we're multiplying before multiplying after differentiating or differentiating after multiplying and this thing here of course it uh, it splits up by the leibniz rule so i'll get psi um, minus x del x psi okay so this cancels out with this and i get uh, proportional to psi and indeed this one over uh, i h bar x hat p hat is equal to one. So you get the um, you get the identity operator. So this is not commutative. Usually it's written as in this way: x hat p hat is equal to i h bar. So h bar uh, this is a parameter which measures the failure of x hat and p hat to commute, okay? And that is the quantum parameter. That's the thing that takes you from classical to quantum uh, mechanics. Um, but it's actually, in, in real life, it's actually just a number it's a, it's a, and it's unitful. So we could just set it to be one and we're not, we're not missing any physics. Okay, so um, okay, so we we so now now we have three operators because we got x hat p hat and one, and we know that the bracket between x hat and p hat is one, and we know also that we, you know whenever you whenever you have operators, the rule is just take their commutators to try to figure out what the Lie algebra is that you're dealing with. Of course, if I take the commutator between one and x hat, that's zero one and p hat is zero. So we, we kind of, we're done in a way. We have really only three operators. So this gives us a three-dimensional Lie algebra, which is the span over C of the basis x hat, p hat, and one, the, op the, unit, the identity operator. Okay, and um, uh, this, uh, this operator, uh, th sorry, this Lie algebra is a very uh, well-known uh, Lie algebra. It's called the Heisenberg Lie algebra. H3. H3 is um, generated by three basis elements. It satisfies X bracket Y is Z. And then Z commutes with X and Y. Okay, this forms a Lie algebra. It's a three-dimensional Lie algebra, which is different from the three-dimensional Lie algebra that we've already seen, namely SO3. Okay. SO3 has X bracket Y is Z and cyclic permutations of that. But this one is, is not. Z is special here, and Z is, is really... Uh, uh, you know, Z corresponds to one, X and Y correspond to P and uh, X and P. 
Okay. And there's a more standard way of writing these operators. We can write them as matrices. So this is, I'm giving now, I'm giving a three-dimensional representation now because here what I, yeah. So let me just write it and then I'll talk. And then Z. These are all upper triangular matrices and they satisfy these commutation relations. So I've given you, okay, so th think of it this way. We're about to break now. So think of it this way that we have a Lie algebra. It's an abstract Lie algebra a, a priori, okay? And here what we have is, is operators, X hat, P hat, and one, which are acting on an infinite dimensional vector space. So we have given an infinite dimensional representation of the Heisenberg Lie algebra. But there is also a finite dimensional representation, which I've given you right here, a matrix for each one of these, a three by three matrix. So this is a three dimensional representation. This is an infinite dimensional representation. Okay, and uh, anyway, so this is gonna be very useful now that we know that our quantum system has a representation of the Heisenberg Lie algebra then we can use it to build other operators. In particular, we're gonna build the Hamiltonian out of this. We're going to try to build a Hamiltonian operator. And once we have that, then we, all we have to do is figure out what the eigenst eigenstates are and how they evolve in time. And then we'll have a solution to the uh, harmonic oscillator. Okay, I'll stop there. Let's break and um, turn off the, well, just don't chat or anything. Just do the test and we'll be back at 3.15. Any questions? If there's a problem, just a private message me in the chat.
Okay. Hope that wasn't too painful. Any questions? Can I ask you a question about what we were just talking about in class? Yep. Uh, yeah, so if this uh, Heisenberg Lie algebra is finite dimensional, like why yeah. would we want to- It is, it is. Yeah, so, so why would we want to consider an infinite dimensional representation of it? I feel like that is going to make your life really difficult no matter what. You know, just because a just because a group or a Lie algebra is finite dimensional, it doesn't mean that it. It doesn't mean that it cannot have um, infinite dimensional representations. And you, it doesn't. It also doesn't mean it. It can't have irreducible infinite dimensional representations. This is a, a phenomenon. Uh, irreducible representations don't have to be finite dimensional. So yeah, um, these representations are out there. You you can't get you can't get away from it. So these are different representations, very different. Okay. So uh, and I, what I'm about to say has bearing on what you just asked about. So let me just get to it. So. Um, so we have this uh, x p hat and one, right? So if I if I if I wanted to to exponentiate this, so if I if I exponentiate a matrix uh, a x plus b y plus c z, right? This is going to be um, the exponential of this upper triangular matrix a b c. And if I work that out, <clears throat> you're gonna get ones down the diagonal because the first term of the exponential is always one, the unit. Uh, <clears throat> the next term will be a, b, one plus x, but then there's gonna be plus one half x squared. And that's gonna give uh, one, that's gonna add here plus one half a, b. Okay, so what you're gonna get by exponentiating is a invertible upper triangular so-called unipotent matrix. And um, the set of all these matrices, so this is in the, you know, what, if you, so in other words, the, the, the Heisenberg group, this is inside H3 and the Heisenberg group, big H3, is literally the set of these matrices. So it's a it's a three-dimensional group. This is very different from uh, a group like SU2, because SU2 is a compact space. This is not compact. This has the topology of R3. So it's like a it's like a group structure on R3. It's a very unusual, uh, kind of an unusual object. Okay, so what this means is that we get an action, we, we have a representation of the the Lie group, the Heisenberg group on L2 of R on the wave functions. Okay. And uh, let's just take a look at what, what this looks like. So if I take e to the a x and I want it to act on a wave function psi, this would be <clears throat> e to the i a x hat applied to, to psi. And what does x hat do? It just multiplies by the function x. So this is the same thing as just e to the i a x psi. So we get a another wave function, which is just a, um, which is uh, a phase multiple, but it's not a phase that's a constant phase, right? This is not equivalent to the original wave function because 
in, in order for two vectors to be the same state, they have to be multiplied by a, fa by a, a single complex number. This is not a single complex number. It's a number that depends on position. So this is a non-trivial, non-trivially different um, state. This is a different state. And so the states are being moved around by this operator in a, in a kind of complicated way. Uh, and that's for every uh, value of A, we get a unitary operator. And, and yeah, you can see that this is unitary because, well, if I take the norm, um, a, a here is in R, right? So if I take the norm of E to the I A X Psi, right? This is gonna be the integral E to the minus I A X Psi bar E to the I A X Psi and these cancel out. So we just get the same as Psi Psi. So this is a unitary, this is definitely a unitary operator preserving the norm on L2. Another example would be e to the a uh, e to the b y let's say acting on a wave function psi. What do you what do you get e to the uh, minus b um, del x um, applied to psi, and this should look familiar. We're taking a vector field and we're exponentiating it. That means that we're doing a flow, and if you do this flow on a vector field. Uh, sorry, on a on a function, what you're going to get is um, the function, but evaluated at a different point. So, in other words, it's taking your function, right, and it is um, uh, basically moving it forward. It's shifting it by b. So this is an operator that takes the wave function and actually translates it by a, a some some uh, yeah by by a, a by a certain amount a certain distance b okay and this is obviously also in L two because if you just take a, a function and move it right that motion is is independent so th this translation it preserves the measure it preserves the the the, the notion of of uh, length and so. Because it's length preserving, that means that the, the integral of the resulting function will be the same. So it preserves norm. So we get another unitary operator. This is a shift operator. It's a B shift operator. Okay. And then finally, we have this e to the uh, e to the cz acting on psi. And what's this going to do? It's um, it's going to. So I, I sorry, I, I should have been a little bit more. Um, uh, the correspondence between these operators and this operator is that x. So sorry, let me let me write it here. So this corresponds to um, minus i x hat. Remember, whenever we have something self-adjoint, the 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 standard way of making it skew adjoint is to multiply by minus i, and this corresponds to minus i times p hat. And this one corresponds to minus i times the unit. Okay, so it's just, it's just the stupid, it's just the annoying fact that uh, self-adjoints are not of the algebra, but rather skew adjoints are. Uh, does that e to the b y operator just shift phase e to the b y? So look at this one. Oh, so, so wait, let me, let me give this and then I'll answer your question. So if you work this one out, this is gonna be um, e to the minus i c times psi. So um, this one is a phase, okay? This one is not changing the physical state. It's only changing the vector in the Hilbert space. The entire thing is being multiplied by a phase and multiplication by a phase, something of unit norm, that's a unitary operator, okay? It's a unitary, but it's a very simple unitary operator. It's just a phase of the entire Hilbert space. This one is not a phase shift. It is a shift of the argument. It's an argument shift. So it's, you're taking the function and you're moving it in space, okay? 
So that's what you would do is if you, if you had some kind of wave function, which represented some probability distribution of a particle, if the particle is moving, you would shift it. You would, you would move the entire probability distribution over. Okay. This one is the one that has a uh, position dependent shift of the phase. So this is, you know, multiplying psi by a different phase, depending on where you are. So this one, um, I don't know what you want to call it, but it is uh, a non-trivial unitary operator. Yes, it would be if psi was periodic. Um, yes, it's possible. Yes, of course, if it's a, if it's an eigen, yeah, correct. Okay, so, so we have these operators. Um, so this means that we get, so we have defined a unitary representation. Oops, one second, uh, having some problem. Um, Okay, sorry. So, so we've defined a unitary representation of this very simple group of the Heisenberg group on L2 functions on R. So this is just a mathematical object. We have a, a, a simple group, I mean, a, a, a very, a very uh, uncomplicated group H3, which is acting on a Hilbert space. Um, and, uh, uh, this uh, this is known as the um, what is it called? This is called the the standard representation of the canonical commutation relations. Okay, so what they, they call it this just because it appears so often. The idea is that whenever you have a position and you have a momentum, the canonically conjugate momentum, in, in classical mechanics, they, their Poisson bracket is like one, right? The, the, the Poisson bracket between P and X is one. In quantum mechanics, it's they become promoted to operators, and their operator commutator is the unit. And um, and so um, so anytime you have a position, anytime you have a, a real position, and you have a co corresponding momentum, then you introduce these operators, and you introduce this uh, representation on L two. And so this thing is the subject of one of the most famous uh, theorems in in the subject of unitary representations. So the, the theorem of Stone von, Neum von Neumann um, which is that any uh, representation, any irreducible, first of all, this is an irreducible representation. And any irreducible representation of H3 on a uh, separable Hilbert space. Separable basically means that it's isomorphic to L2. So most Hilbert spaces that come up in, in quantum mechanics are separable Hilbert spaces and they're isomorphic to L2 of R. Even if you're working on a higher dimensional manifold, you're still, you can still, uh, although it might be unnatural, you can still identify the Hilbert space with L2 of R or with little l2, like uh, uh, we, we, we used in the assignment. 
So any irreducible of H3 uh, representation on separable Hilbert space such that the derivative of the representation, when you look at how it acts on Z, we just get the uh, unit. Uh, this thing is, it, it must be this one. So in other words, this thing is unique. It's the unique irreducible representation of H3 in such a way that Z goes to the identity operator. Okay, so uh, this is just this just goes to show uh, kind of how um, how you, how kind of important or like um, it's a really a discovery of a mathematical object which is very universal. This fact that uh, you, that you have x and p um, acting on L two functions on the real line it has a universal uh, kind of status. Yeah, uh, James, question. Yeah, um, when we talked about when we like first introduced representations on finite dimensions, we made the requirement that our representations were continuous. So I would guess that there is some sort of continuity requirement here when we talk about infinite dimensional representations, but I was wondering what exactly that was. Um, well, I mean, it turns out that when you're dealing with, with groups, uh, there's a lot of continuity and differentiability that comes for free. Mm -hmm. um, so um, but but of course uh, you could you could just say the same thing that you see like these operators they're uh, unitary and they would be continuous operators on Hilbert space they would be bounded operators all these mm -hmm. things, bounded operators and so it makes perfect sense to require the um, action map from the group cross the Hilbert space to the Hilbert space to be continuous. And these, these would, would be examples of such things. So you could definitely use the same definition in this case. Okay. Uh, you don't have to worry about um, unitary operators being um, unbounded because they, 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 they just preserve, the, uh, they preserve the, uh, the norm. But if we're thinking of that as a map from the group into bounded operators on H, Yes. There's like a whole bunch of topologies on B of H, right? What, which topology does this notion of continuity correspond to? I guess is what uh, I'm asking. I think it probably, I, I don't, off the top of my head, I don't remember, but probably all of them. Okay. Yeah. Thanks. Uh, you can correct me if I'm wrong. So, okay. So let's get to the, let's get to the, uh, to the, um, to the main point. So, so now let's solve. Let's solve the harmonic oscillator. So, so we have uh, L2 is our space, L2 functions on the real line, and we want to introduce the Hamiltonian. And we um, have an obvious guess to make. We just take the Hamiltonian from the classical case Okay, and we just put little hats on it and then we're done. Okay, so this is a good guess for what the operator should be. And it's unambiguous because here I only have P multiplied with P and here I only have X multiplied with X. If I had an X multiplied by P, then I'd be in trouble because it's unclear whether this should go to X hat P hat or to P hat X hat, okay? So this is the perennial problem of quantization. This is the reason why quantization is not uh, a constructive procedure. But in this case, um, there is no ambiguity, okay? So this ordering ambiguity, so-called ordering ambiguity, does not occur. Because in my Hamiltonian, I don't have XP factors some ends. Okay, so this is, our, our, this is a good guess. I, I, can, I, don't, I don't know the history of who was the first person to write down this guess and to actually try to solve. It probably was Schrodinger, but I can just imagine, like just imagine fr from this point forward, we're gonna do a whole bunch of steps, which are elementary mathematical steps, and we're gonna get some incredible results. I could just imagine how you know, how amazed the first person to make this guess 
might have been. Like to, as soon as we write this down, now we can just turn the crank and figure out what the system, how the system behaves. So if we write this out, um, remember that p hat is differentiation. So this is going to give a second derivative operator. That's for the p hat squared. And then we're going to have the k x squared, which is just multiplication by x squared. So instead of writing mx squared, I'm just going to write it the way they traditionally do by just putting an x squared there, because this is now going to act on, on uh, you know, on, on a, uh, on a function. So this is the operator. This is the operator h on l2. Okay, and this is um, <clears throat> so. So whenever. Uh, um, Right. Right. So what are you supposed to do? What does it mean to solve? Well, um, really what we would like to do is we would like to understand to, you know, what does it mean to solve? It means that we want to know how states evolve in time. That's what it means to solve, right? Because you're trying to predict the future. That's what everyone's obsessed obsessed with. They, they don't care about the past. They want to predict the future and forget about the present. No one even understands what's going on. So uh, in, order to, uh, in order to predict how states will evolve in time, the typical strategy is to use an eigenspace decomposition, right? So we, what we do is we look for eigenstates of H, because if I can solve this equation, Right. If if uh, if I can find an eigenvector for h hat with eigenvalue e, okay, then I can solve this equation. Right. I can do if my time flow, if the unitary flow, um, the unitary flow of psi e, this would be e to the um, uh, minus i h hat t applied to psi e, okay? So that's, I, I multiplied, you know, like a, like a good student, I multiplied my self adjoint by minus i, thereby making it a skew adjoint. This is then the generator for time translation symmetry. And I uh, apply the exponential to that and I apply it to psi e. And, and I know that this is just, e to the minus i e t psi e at time zero. So that means that I will have figured out what psi e, how it evolves in time. The way that it evolves in time is exactly by applying the Hamiltonian. If I am in an eigenstate, then what it means is that it just rotates with a certain phase. Okay, so then the, the next step in the, in the strategy, so the strategy is number one, look for eigenstates. Number two, decompose any wave function, psi, in terms of some coefficients um, in terms of the eigenstates. So you're hoping that there will be a basis of eigenstates. We're hoping uh, there is a basis of eigenstates. And the reason why this hope is justified to some extent uh, by the spectral theorem. So you have to be careful about exactly what kind of operator you have. We're going to deal with that later. Depending on what kind of self-adjoint operator you have, you can have a basis of eigenstates and um, and then we're gonna we're going to do like a Fourier analysis kind of where we we expand every state in L two as a sum of of uh, components along the eigenstates of this Hamiltonian, and then we're going to know how all the components evolve in time by phases, depending on the energy level e. Okay, depending on if it's a higher energy state, then it rotates faster uh, in terms of its phase, 
And then when we take the sum of all those rotating phases, we're going to get the evolution of the, the, uh, uh, of the state. Okay, So it all boils down to this, finding eigenstates. That's the reason why eigenstates are so important. It's basically from a Fourier point of view. Is it clear? I'm going to launch now into finding eigenstates. Is it OK? Should I explain? So to solve, it boils down to, so that means that solving boils down to finding eigenstates, eigen, eigenstates of h hat. OK, so let's do that. So we are looking for h hat psi equals e psi. The question? No. James has his hand up, but he doesn't have his hand up. OK. Um, OK, so um, so I'm not, I mean, there's many different ways of doing this. We're just solving a second order uh, differential equation. It's, it's nothing, uh, nothing too, uh, too advanced or difficult. But there is a cool way of doing it, which is really um, at the heart of future developments in physics after this point. Um, and uh, <clears throat> it's, uh, this method is inspired by the solution of the wave function by factoring the differential operator. Some of you may be aware of this, that when you have the wave equation, which is dt squared, del t squared minus dx squared, psi equals zero or equals whatever, that you factor the, the differential operator into del t minus del x times del t plus del x. And then you express every, every function as a sum of left moving and right moving waves. Okay, So this is a, this is a version of that technique. Um, and it, it uh, it's known as the method of um, raising and lowering operators. And this, uh, this method is very influential in the future development of quantum field theory. So it's, um, it's essential for understanding uh, quantum field theory, this particular method of solving so that's why I'm going to present this uh, this one this way. Okay, so uh, so the key idea is that we want to factor this second order differential equation, right? But look at uh, look at the operator. Look look at it. It's just a sum of squares. So in order to factor this, we're going to have this minus i. We're going to have p minus i x, p minus i x, and p plus i x. That's how we're going to factor it. So let's do that. So, um, so the, the main the main step the main step is to factor. I don't know why it's doing this. Do you hear that? Oh, okay. Main step: factor the operator. One second. So we're going to define A to be um, this operator, x hat plus i times p hat. I'm just putting the right factors in front. They're not important. We can, uh, uh, we can set, yeah. Well, we can't oh, see what goodness. you're right. Uh, started doing this again. One second. Okay, yeah. So, so I'm just writing the operator x hat plus i times p hat, but I'm putting the right factors in front. And then I'm going to just, let's forget about these factors because they're irrelevant. So m omega h bar, let's put them all equal to one. So we get a is one over square root two times x hat plus i p hat. 
Okay, now this operator is no longer self-adjoint because it's, it's, a, it's a complex linear combination of self-adjoint operators. So this is um, not self-adjoint. Okay. And it, what it's so therefore it has an adjoint, which is not itself. And that adjoint is exactly uh, X hat minus IP hat. So we have our, um, this one is called the raising operator and we'll see why in a second. And this one is the lowering operator and we'll see why in a second. Okay, and let's uh, just, uh, I mean, obviously uh, if I wanted to write X hat back again, I could just take A plus A adjoint divided by square, square root two, or if I wanted to produce P hat, I would get one over I square root two, A minus A uh, adjoint. And the key point is that uh, if, you, if you take the commutator between A and A uh, dagger, uh, uh, the commutator between X and X dagger is going to be zero and the, the commutator between P and P is zero. So the only uh, terms that, con that contribute to A bracket A dagger, okay, are going to be X bracket P, okay, um, which is going to be I, but then there's a minus I here, and then X bracket P again. So I'm going to get basically x, bra uh, x bracket p minus p bracket x, and then there's a square root two. So in the end, uh, these factors have been chosen so that this is just one. So now I, I have a new basis for the Heisenberg algebra. This is a new basis for H3 which is just a, a dagger and one. Okay, but it's not really H3, it's the complexification of H3. It's the tensor product of H3 with C. This tensor product is, it just means that you take a complex linear combination of the basis rather than real. Okay. So um, I've just changed my basis basically, and now I'm going to rewrite everything in terms of this basis. So I did already write I wrote X and P in terms of this basis. And now I want to write the operator that I care about, H hat. I want to take this operator and write it in terms of that basis. So I will get H is one half A plus A dagger squared minus one half A minus A dagger squared. This is the X squared and this is the P squared. And this is gonna be one half of A, A dagger plus A dagger A. And if I rewrite this using the commutation, I'm gonna get A dagger A plus one half. So this is my operator. So now it looks, it looks nice. It looks like A dagger A plus a number times one. Okay, so, uh, so basically I've just changed basis. I haven't done anything. Um, uh, and now we, we want to look for eigenvalues of this thing. Uh, because, it, because it's so nice and everything, this thing has a name. This little, this piece of the Hamiltonian has a name. It's called N and it's called the number operator. Okay, and um, uh, and and now we can just play with these and try to figure out uh, some basic properties of this operator. So uh, he here's some some basic properties properties of these. Uh, of, of H or, uh, or N, just, just to get rid of this annoying little one half. 
Okay, the first important thing is that suppose that I have a vector which is an eigenvector uh, for n. So v is non-zero. Suppose I have an, an eigenvector for n. So I, I might want to know, uh, I, I, so what you could do is you could um, try to try to extract some information about the eigenvalue. So can we say anything about the about C? Well, one thing you could do is you could um, you could take the inner product between V and NV. And this would be C times VV. And if I write the definition of N, this is A uh, transpose A, A, A dagger A. And this uh, A dagger, that's the adjoint of A, I can bring it to the other side. So this will be AV, AV. So this tells me that C is a V A V divided by V V. So we get something that is maybe kind of mild, but really important, which is that the eigenvector, the eigens, uh, the eigenvalue is non-negative. This is a non-negative real number. How important this is. This is really, really important. There's no reason why this uh, self-adjoint operator should have positive eigenvalues, right? It could have negative eigenvalues going all the way to minus infinity in principle. But, um, but this thing has non-negative uh, eigenvalues. So that means that the universe can, can exist. It means that we can be stable. It means that we can sit at a low energy and we don't have to be afraid of falling to minus 50, minus a thousand, minus million energies, right? Without this lower bound on energy, we're finished. There can't be, there cannot be anything stable, right? And that's why, you know, finding, uh, finding this harmonic oscillator is so important. The same tr thing was true, by the way, in the classical system. In the classical system, you couldn't, th there was a minimum energy for that uh, harmonic oscillator. Uh, it, it just stayed stationary at the origin and that was energy zero. So the spectrum of H hat is positive. Why do I say positive? It's just because there's that one half here. So this thing has, could have an eigenvalue zero in principle, but uh, H hat cannot, it has to be positive. So by the way, you know, well, yeah, so they, well, anyway, I won't say, I won't mention that. So s second thing that's important, suppose that NV is CV, suppose we have uh, an, eigens, an eigenvector and suppose that I apply A uh, to, to this vector. Then I could check uh, the following. I could apply n to it. This is a dagger a, um, a dagger a, a v. Um, and, uh, um, And this I can write using the commutation relation here. I just want to make sure that I wrote it correctly 
a a dagger. So a, a a dagger minus a dagger a equals one. So that means that a dagger a is equal to a a dagger minus one. And if I rewrite this, I'll get a times a dagger a minus a times v. And this is a n again. This is a, another n showing up minus a v. And this is equal to c because v is an eigenstate of n. And this just gives me c minus 1 times a v. So if you look at the beginning, we see that it's still an eigenvector. And so it has an eigenvalue one lower than v. So the, the, the effect of applying the operator A is that it lowers the energy, eigens, the energy by one unit. And then A dagger V, uh, maybe not surprisingly, similarly, if I do this, it'll be uh, A dagger A, A dagger V. And this will be, um, Uh, sorry, did I do that right? A dagger A. Okay, and then if I switch uh, this one, this will be A dagger um, A dagger A plus one V, and this will be A dagger um, N plus A dagger applied to V. And V is an eigenstate, so I get C plus one times A dagger V. Okay, so this one raises the eigenvalue. Okay, so um, I'm not going to do the rest today. I'll, I'll finish it on uh, on on Wednesday. But this is the key point: is that you, you we have basically everything that we need, even though we know nothing about this. You know, there's this is a space of functions. The functions are complicated. They depend on x, the wave functions. We have this operator that's differentiating, blah blah blah. But what we do know is that this operator that we're interested in, this energy. Okay, it has positive eigenvalues. And we also know that there are these special operators, A and A dagger, that will take an eigenstate and move it down in energy and move it up by an integer, by, by an integer. So all we need to do is we need to figure out, you know, we, we need to do the same type of idea that we did with SU2. Remember that in order to build the representation of SU2, we looked for a highest weight and we took that and we generated all the others. Similarly here, what we're gonna to try to do is find something with the lowest energy. We're gonna find a state that is an eigenstate with eigenvalue zero or one half or whatever the lowest energy is. And then we're gonna use the raising operator to go up and produce um, you know, a, um, the entire tower. And so it, it will boil down, it basically will boil down to solving a psi equals zero. As soon as we find the lowest, this is an analog of the lowest weight. Okay. And it's really the lowest energy state, or in other words, it's the, the vacuum. So if you can find the vacuum, okay, and then you just hit it with the raising operator, you'll produce all the states, and they're all going to be eigenstates. So it's a, it's a remarkable uh, way of, um, of obtaining the uh, of obtaining the solution. So and and we'll see uh, we'll see what those functions look like on 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 Wednesday. But basically, the 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 conceptual strategy is in place. We just need to implement uh, this lowest weight type calculation. Okay, I'll leave it there. 
It's very nice outside, but it's very windy, which probably means that there's a cold front coming in. So we're all going to get clobbered. Enjoy the weekend. Any, qu any questions at the end? I just had a question about the quizzes. Oh, yeah. Would it be possible to let us see our answers to the quizzes? I think we can yeah, see the see? we can see, I think, the answers on the first quiz, but not our answers on the second quiz. OK, like we can see the mark, but not actually. Okay. What the thing is, when you when right. you when you set up a quiz, uh, yeah. the answer is yes. I'll, 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 I'll sure. Thanks. When you set up a quiz, there's like there's probably like 50 different check boxes of all the different options of what you want to allow. Do you want to let you know, if I wanted to, you know, if I wanted to order the tooth fairy to bring you your half of your quiz, quiz answers under your pillow on Thursdays at 5 a.m., there's a checkbox for that. And so I can never figure out what bloody checkboxes I'm supposed, anyway. Okay, so yes, I will do it. Okay, thank you. Thanks. Have a good weekend, everyone. Um, can, can, I, oh. can I ask a fun question? Yes. So I was uh, going over. Uh oh. Uh, sorry. Yeah. So I was going over one. Your battery uh, ran out just then. <laughs> yeah, it, it just went. The out. end of class when you ask a question, then your battery runs out. Yeah. Um, so okay. um, I was watching one lecture recording, and I don't know how much this is re related to class content, but I saw that there were a couple of tablas lying behind you. So uh, I thought maybe it would be fun to you know uh, like ask about them because my, you, my you, uh, really do you, you don't play tabla, do you? No, my dad is interested though. Like he oh, plays really? like oh, yeah, a couple of uh, classical instruments. Oh really? Oh yeah. yeah. I've been taking tabla for a long time for uh, uh, seven years now. Oh okay. Because in Toronto, there's a very good tabla school uh, called the Toronto Tabla Ensemble. Yeah, I didn't know about that, but that's, Sorry? that's good to know. I, yeah. I didn't know about that, but that's good to know. Yeah. So. Uh, if you uh, if you search if you want to, if everyone wants to learn uh, a really if you want to see some mind blowing uh, tabla performance, my favorite is my teacher's teacher. His name is Swapenji. Look for look for Swapen Chaudhuri tabla solo on on uh, on YouTube and. Uh, it starts off slow and, and the performance goes for usually an hour and a half and it gets faster and faster. I'm sure Jai knows about this. But um, yeah, if you, if you pay attention to what he's doing, uh, it will blow your mind. It's pretty crazy what he's able to do. Okay. Yeah, thank you. We'll talk about it again another day, maybe. Maybe your dad can perform for us. He's probably an expert. <laughs> Okay, see you later. Have a good weekend.